Hello, Charles Mercier here. Let's look together at a few good objects from ancient art at the Yale University Art Gallery. The earliest surviving paintings to decorate a Christian church are in New Haven, Connecticut. A surprising statement, but this is how it happened. What we call Dura Europus was a town on a bluff over the Euphrates River in what is now modern Syria. It was a Roman garrison town on the very eastern frontier of the Roman Empire from 165 to 256 CE. The garrison fell to the Sasanian Persians in 256 CE and was never resettled. The site was then excavated by the French Academy and Yale University in the years 1928 to 1937. Yale took back to New Haven a large amount of archaeological material, which included fragments of paintings on the walls of the baptism room in a Christian house church discovered in Dura. Material from Dura Europus is on permanent display in galleries at Yale, renovated and reinstalled recently in 2012 and again in 2019, the Mary and James Ottaway Gallery of Ancient Dura Europus. The unusual circumstances, the sudden fall of Dura in a war, its immediate submersion in the dry desert sand, preserved materials that usually are not preserved, something like what happened at Pompeii, textiles, reading and writing materials, personal items like shoes and baskets, a unique scutum, shield, unique horse armor, and paintings. A number of surviving paintings depict vividly the presence of the Roman occupying power. This is a tile from the ceiling of a house, a real Dura personality, Heliodorus, the Actuarius, the accountant, a Roman officer keeping accounts and paying military wages. Here is the commander of the 20th cohort of Palmyrenes, the unit stationed at Dura, military tribune Julius Terentius, making an incense sacrifice to the gods of Rome before a military standard with his staff and soldiers behind him. We'll make a video about that painting sometime. That painting decorated the entry porch of the Temple of Bel, but there were also private religious buildings in Dura with paintings that survive. Three of these were private houses converted to religious use. A Mithraeum, a place of worship of the Persian god Mithra, popular with the Roman military, a Jewish synagogue, and a Christian house church in use from about 240 to 256 CE, which we'll be focusing on here. You can see on the map where these buildings were in relation to one another. Top to bottom, along the western wall, the Temple of Bel, Mithraeum, Synagogue, Christian House. Christians of the time met and worshipped in a private house, a domus ecclesiae, a house for the assembly. In New Testament times, a married couple named Aquila and Prisca, or Priscilla, had house churches in Corinth and in Rome, to which Paul sends greetings in two of his letters. Aquila and Prisca had become Christian missionaries after they met Paul in Corinth about the year 49 CE. Pause the video and read some of these texts as they go by. 150 years later, the Christian apologist Minutius Felix, writing in Latin in Rome about the year 200 CE, made a positive apologetical point out of Christians worshipping in small houses. Christians had not yet adapted Roman imperial architecture for their churches as they would after the Roman emperors established Christianity and enforced Christian orthodoxy. Minutius Felix has Christian Octavius argue to his pagan interlocutor that Christians worship simply, in private, in truth. We do not have shrines and altars, but do you think that's because we're hiding what we worship? What temple could I build for him when this whole world that he fashioned with his work cannot contain him? The Christian house church uncovered at Dura Europus is unique evidence for Christian life in the 3rd century CE and a unique opportunity to think with an early Christian imagination. This is how it looked on the ground. And this is a plan of the Christian house at Dura, a house with rooms around a courtyard on the left, a meeting space, assembly hall, with a raised platform for teaching, prayer, and Eucharist, with room for some 75 persons. 
If it was decorated with paintings, they are not preserved. On the right, a room for baptism with a baptismal basin in a semicircular niche or niche. The baptistry received more artistic attention, as far as we can tell, than the Eucharistic Hall, special decoration for the place of the unique, unrepeatable moment of initiation. The layout of the Christian house helps us to visualize a passage in Justin Martyr's first apology from a hundred years earlier on the movement of the newly initiated into the Eucharistic room after baptism. After the washing, we lead the one who has been convinced and has agreed to those called brothers in the place where they are gathered to pray in common for ourselves and the one just enlightened. This Christian assembly of Dura decorated their baptistry with paintings. These are the subjects of the surviving paintings. A woman at a well, David slaying Goliath, Jesus healing the paralytic at the pool of Bethzatha, Jesus enabling Peter to walk on the water, a procession of women with torches, the good shepherd and the sheep, Adam and Eve. We'll consider each one of these and draw much from the excellent and intriguing book by Michael Peppard, The World's Oldest Church, which is generously available on open access from Yale and JSTOR. This is a woman, alone, bending over a well to draw water, holding a rope for her jar, looking out or over her shoulder. Who is she? You think first of the Samaritan woman who met Jesus at a well in the town of Sychar in John 4. Jesus sat down beside the well. There comes a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus says to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who is saying to you, Give me to drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Yet Jesus is not depicted here, as he is in other ancient representations of the scene. There are other biblical women who went to a well and ended up meeting their spouses there. Rebecca met Isaac at a well in Genesis 24. Rachel met Jacob in Genesis 29. Zipporah met Moses in Exodus 2. The woman could also be Mary, and if it is, as Peppard argues, it is the earliest datable representation of the mother of Jesus in art. In the Proto-Evangelium of James, 2nd century, non-canonical infancy gospel, widely read in Syria, the Annunciation takes place as Mary draws water, an expansion of Luke, which does not specify that. And she took the jar and went out to fill it with water, and behold, there was a voice saying to her, Rejoice, blessed one. And Mary was looking around, right and left, for where this voice was from. Peppard compares a number of representations in later medieval manuscript art of the Annunciation at a well. So this woman at a well in the Dura Baptistry could be the Samaritan woman, Rebecca, Rachel, Zipporah, or Mary, the mother of Jesus. Perhaps the image is polysemic and refers to all of them, women who encountered water and in doing so met their spouse. While we look at these paintings, we should remember that their meaning and iconography is potentially fluid, just as what was canonical scripture at the time was still fluid. You can hardly make it out, even in the museum, but this is David who has slain Goliath in 1 Samuel 17. Inscriptions identify the poorly preserved figures. The patron who contributed the image is named and remembered in an inscription above the image, Proclus a Roman name associated with the army garrison. This is Jesus healing the paralytic at the pool of Bethzatha by the sheep gate in Jerusalem in John 5. The man had no one to put him into the healing water, so Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your pallet and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his pallet and walks. This is Jesus enabling Peter to walk on the water of the Sea of Galilee in Matthew 14. He came to his disciples at night walking on the sea. They are in the boat, arms stretched out in amazement or prayer. Jesus invites Peter to come to him over the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. Jesus here is on the left, lower as if closer to us enabling Peter forward. 
The painting passes over Peter's floundering and lapse of faith, which comes next in Matthew. Jesus here empowers his disciple over the water. The best preserved fragment presents us with the most challenging question of iconography. This is a succession of women with white veils and white garments carrying torches. Who are they? A procession is a traditional subject in ancient religious art. Young men with water jars on the Parthenon frieze, imperial family members on the Ara Pakis Augustae, more recently a procession of saints in a tapestry by John Nava for the nave of the 2002 Cathedral of Our Lady of the Angels in Los Angeles. These women have been thought gospel women on their way to Jesus' tomb on Easter morning to anoint Jesus' body. The stars are shining. It is not yet daylight. In this interpretation, the large white structure is the tomb building, or sarcophagus, and the women are carrying containers with oil and spice for the anointing. Yet why is the sarcophagus so big, or why are there no other indicators, like guards or angels? Women at the tomb and other ancient depictions of the scene do not carry torches. Another interpretation, argued for by Peppard, is that they are the prudent virgins of Matthew 25, who at midnight were ready to meet the bridegroom and had their torches ready. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be compared to ten bridesmaids, virgin brides, who took their torches and went out to meet the bridegroom. The prudent ones took oil in containers with their torches. The building is then a wedding tent or a bridal chamber where the marriage will be consummated and their containers contain oil to fuel their torches. Finally, the baptistry, of course, had a baptismal basin. In the semicircular area above the basin was painted Christ as shepherd with his flock of sheep, as from Luke 15. What man among you, having a hundred sheep who lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the desert and go for the lost one until he finds it? And after he finds it, he puts it on his shoulders, rejoicing. Jesus Christ as Good Shepherd is common in Christian catacomb paintings. It is a Christian adaptation of the pagan subject for sculpture, a kreophoros or moskophoros, a man carrying on his shoulder an expensive animal for sacrifice. Added above the baptismal basin was Adam and Eve from Genesis 3, committing their primordial sin, eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The painting is not well preserved and was not well painted in the first place, but a drawing shows them clearly identifiable. Adam and Eve pull fruit from a tree, covering their genitalia in shame with aprons of fig leaves, with the serpent below them. And the snake said to the woman, You will be as gods, knowing good and evil. And the woman saw that the tree was good for eating, and that it was pleasing to the eyes to see, and lovely for knowing, and she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave it also to her man with her, and they ate. And their eyes were opened, the two of them, and they recognized that they were naked, and they sewed leaves of fig, and made for themselves aprons. Some broader questions to think about. What does it mean that in Dura in the mid-third century, the same designers and craftsmen might work on a Mithraeum, a synagogue, and a Christian house church? We are reminded that Roman persecution of Christians was sporadic. Here in a Roman garrison town, Christians worshipped in the years 240 to 256 CE. In a private house, yes, but the Christian church could not have been much of a secret. A design idea common to three private religious buildings at Dura was to emphasize something important with a semicircular arch. In the Mithraeum, the image of Mithra slaying the cosmic bull. In the synagogue, the shrine for the Torah. In the Christian church, the baptismal basin. The proximity of Mithraeum and church is the same proximity that occurred to Justin Martyr when he noticed what he thought superficial similarities between the Christian Eucharist and Mithraic ritual. Wicked demons imitated the Christian Eucharist and arranged that this happen also in the mysteries of Mithra. You can know or find out that in the rites of the one being initiated, bread and a cup of water are set at table with some words. 
And why did the Christians of the Dura Church choose to decorate their baptistry with these images in particular, choices perhaps less familiar to us? More familiar to us as a subject for a baptistry, the baptism of Jesus himself by John the Baptist, as in this example, in another tapestry by John Nava for the baptistry of the Los Angeles Cathedral that emphasizes Jesus Christ as the suffering servant of Isaiah. We do have to bear in mind that only a small part of the Dura baptistry paintings are preserved. As with everything that relates to the ancient world, what we say is based on fragments of a whole. The baptism of Jesus could well have been depicted at Dura, but has not survived for us to see. Several themes run through the surviving Dura baptistry paintings, obviously or subtly appropriate. Water, shepherds, and marriage. And again, reference and meaning can be fluid. The imagery is susceptible imaginatively to more than one interpretation or association. The theme of water is obviously appropriate to a baptistry. At the well at Sychar, Jesus promised the woman of Samaria, the water I shall give will become a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Jesus is master of the waters when he walks on the Sea of Galilee, empowering Peter to do the same, and when he cures the paralytic at the pool. The painter has connected the two scenes, mingling the waters of Kinneret and Bezata, by having them flow into one another. It may be that paintings that haven't survived of other scenes of Jesus' miracles were linked by a river of water flowing from scene to scene, a motif appropriate to a church located on the banks of the great river Euphrates. Cyril of Jerusalem connected the two scenes in the same way in a fourth century homily on the paralytic. Why do you wait for a pool of water? You have the one who walks over the waters, who rebukes the winds, who reigns the sea, who treats the sea as paved foundation, not only for himself, but also graced Peter with a similar power of walking. There was present at the waters of the pool, the master of the waters and their maker. The good shepherd waters his sheep. In Psalm 23, 22 in the Septuagint, the Lord shepherds me in a place of green, there he settled me in water of rest, he nourished me. The baptized become sheep of the flock incorporated in the new community. What are David and Goliath doing in a baptistry? David was also a shepherd, anointed as those being baptized, to defend his people in war as the Davidic Jesus protects his flock from predators. As much as half the population of Dura was affiliated with the Roman military garrison, among them perhaps some of these Christians. Proclus, who dedicated the David and Goliath painting, has a Roman name associated with the garrison. David defeated Goliath with stones drawn from a river. It would appeal to members of the 20th Palmyrene, or those protected by them on the Roman frontier, to be thought soldiers of the heavenly king, defending the eastern border of the Roman Empire against the Philistine Sassanian on the other side of the Euphrates. Eusebius called the Lord of the Lord is my shepherd psalm, the one who came to be a shepherd and as a bridegroom. Marriage is another theme in the baptistry paintings. The women who met their spouses at the water source, or even the woman at the well of Sychar who told the Lord she had no husband. And of course, the wise bridesmaids ready for the wedding feast. Torches at a Greek wedding symbolized legitimate marriage, as we talked about in the video about the Emesis painter wedding procession. In 4th century preaching, the prudent virgins ready to meet the bridegroom were models for those being baptized. From Gregory Nazianzen, the torches you will kindle are a sacrament of the procession of light to come, with which we will meet the bridegroom as bright and virginal souls, our torches bright with faith, neither sleeping for laziness, such that we miss the unexpected arrival of the one we expect, nor unnourished and without oil and lacking good works, such that we are thrown from the bridal chamber. And perhaps Adam and Eve are painted above the baptismal basin, not as emblems of the original sin, but as participants in the primordial marriage. 
The Dura baptistry paintings may not be so sophisticated as artwork, but they are surprisingly sophisticated in their imaginative theology. Catholic Pope John Paul II called marriage the primordial sacrament. The nuptial dimension of Christian sacraments is a current concern, reflected, for example, in the 1992 Catholic Catechism. The entire Christian life bears the mark of the spousal love of Christ and the Church. Already baptism, the entry into the people of God, is a nuptial mystery. It is, so to speak, the nuptial bath which precedes the wedding feast, the Eucharist. In Paul's letter to the Galatians, there is no male or female in Christ. In this nuptial understanding, men as well as women are spiritual brides of Christ, the bridegroom. In the Dura Baptistry, baptism is a return to paradise, an entry into the wedding feast of the Lamb for those who have made themselves ready. As in the book of Revelation, and I heard as if the voice of a great crowd and of many waters and of loud thunderings saying, Hallelujah, the Lord our God is King, the Almighty. Let us rejoice and exalt and give glory to him because the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Thanks for watching.